So, Nali, this is the microphone. You don't have to talk like this, but stand here because we are broadcasting this. Okay, so I have to stand here. So stand on this side, not on the other side. Okay. Mm. But you're not supposed to have to speak directly into it. Just, just be a little loud. Well, I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we'll just start and we're going to have this in English because our presenter is going to speak in English. So we have Dr. Shanali Bajaj, or how do you pronounce it? Bajaj. Bajaj, sorry. <laughs> so she's a dermatologist from India and, and she'll be starting here. So she's going to have a little, uh, yeah, she's going to have a talk here on emergencies in dermatology. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Gandhi and everyone. Uh, I am going to start with my topic on emergencies in dermatology. It is a very interesting topic because not everybody knows about it and it can be confusing at times. So I thought of picking up this topic so that everyone from the you know, candidates to senior specialists can understand that dermatologists actually do some emergency work also. So uh, a little about myself. Uh, I'm from India, as you all know, and I'm starting work here in the hospital in Akureyri and I'm very excited about it and uh, I am still doing I have done my CM medical schooling from Saptajang hospital and my postgraduate training in Aramula hospital both are located in the heart of Delhi both these hospitals are tertiary care hospitals with 1600 bedded uh, strength and they have a 2 million patient attendance in OPD itself that is outpatient department the, and they see over 800 patients in the emergency department daily. Yeah. So this is a normal view of our outpatient department daily. Yeah, that's a lot. Okay, coming a little on my publications. I have nine national and international publications along with one book chapter. And my clinical experience ranges from common dermatological conditions such as psoriasis, eczema, vitiligo, and to rare syndrome. I've served as a senior resident in a 30-bedded ward unique to dermatology itself, and we take care of ICU patients of dermatology. I've been trained at performing almost uh, all dermatological procedures ranging from minor surgeries such as radiofrequency to major surgeries such as split thickness, skin graft, vitiligo surgery, and hair transplants. I have worked with many lasers, phototherapy machines, patch testing, chemical peeling, etc. And on an average, in a month, we would serve about six to eight emergencies. Uh, I would like to share with you some of my surgical results. Here is a boy who had come with vitiligo, that is loss of pigmentation over his forehead and eyelid. Uh, he was very frustrated with it, so he ended up applying caustic chemical on his eyelid and forehead. This led to a lot of scarring and loss of eyebrows. We eventually did, uh, did a series of surgeries in him, starting from punch, thick, uh, punch grafting on the eyelids. This is an after photograph because I didn't have a before photograph from this stage. Slowly, this uh, eyelid surge, punch grafting led to pigmentation of the eyelashes, which was followed by an eyebrow transplant. As his eyebrows, we wanted to make them as symmetrical as possible. He had a thinness in the medial aspect on his normal eye eyebrow. That is why we tried to maintain the symmetry and give him thickness around the corner and thin around the center. This is my final result. And the patient was very happy. Another young man came to me with 
uh, vitiligo again depigmentation and he had been refused many times in marriage uh, so he was very frustrated we did a split thickness skin graft and he got pretty decent cosmetic result so coming on to today's talk it's a lovely new day in the er you have just resuscitated a coding patient and you think oh my god i was born to do this and then the nurse calls and says uh, doc there is a patient with a skin rash <laughs> and you are like oh god why was i sleeping through my derm rest training <laughs> so here's where today's talk comes of use i hope you guys have had your coffee because the lights are dim so how do i find out where uh, what is a potential dermatological emergency <clears throat> the patient comes with fever rash and altered vitals does the patient come with denuded skin and fever is there a rash in an immunocompromised patient like a severely uh, no, uh, severely altered diabetes or hiv patients is there a full body redness these are the pointers which make you feel that okay this is a real emergency and i don't need to send this patient off home think about it how do i classify the drug reactions how do i classify sorry the emergencies most importantly it's the drug rash second comes autoimmune conditions like psoriasis pemphigus vasculitis followed by infections so here is your first scenario this 45 year old woman came with newly diagnosed seizure disorder and was started on phenytoin 3 weeks ago on looking at her you notice there are painful erosions and crusts over the face arms chest back and similar erosions are seen on the oral mucosa conjunctiva of eyes and nasal mucosa so how do you approach such patients well you must in, in your history you must notice that it's a sudden onset the patient was all right a week ago and now he's developed this rash the patient is very sick looking and there is history of some medicine intake usually there is a temporal association with the drug intake and the onset of symptoms which usually lies in the time period of 7 to 21 days you must know your seven eyes of drug history intake uh, history examination which i'll explain you in the next slide what type of a rash are you seeing is it an exanthematous rash okay what's exanthematous basically redness all over the body with small red bumps or is it a blistering sort of a rash is the mucosa involved are the vitals altered these are the most important things that you think about when you look at such patients <coughs> how do you complete your drug history so that you don't miss any drug that you could have missed there are the seven eyes whether the patient ingested the drugs as in orally whether the patient inhaled the drugs like inhalers did the patient insert any drug like rectal or vaginal pessaries did the patient instill any drugs like eye drops did what did he receive any injections recently was there any incognito type of a drug like herbs oils alternative system of medicine drugs or did the patient take the drug intermittently and forgets to mention to you so this patient had steven johnson syndrome it's a severe life threatening mucocutaneous disease but there is no definitive lab test to prove like almost with every dermatological condition How, you usually diagnose it clinically the rash is a deep red painful skin along with areas of loss of epithelium but the denuded areas are limited to 10% of body surface area you may find atypical target oil lesions what are target oil lesions i'll be explaining it to you in a little while are uh, usually two or more mucosa are involved like the eye the nasal mucosa oropharynx or the genitalia and the patient usually because of so much inflammation going on in his skin would be having fever tachypnea tachycardia and hypertension so what are the causes almost 90 99% of the time it is drugs usually anticonvulsants followed by antibiotics and nsaids all three are very common causes sometimes it may be idiopathic this is a second scenario a 5 year old boy presented with painful rash over both hands and feet history of intake of ibuprofen 5 days ago when you look at the patient you can see a classic target rash target or a bull's eye rash that means there are concentric rings of central dusky hue pale edematous central layer and outer peripheral erythema the lesions are painful but no mucosa seems to be involved so what is your most likely diagnosis i'm sure steven johnson syndrome is out so which is it 
It is erythema multiforme. It's basically a less severe type of a drug rash. The clinical symptoms again have no de definitive lab test, and the lesions are target, target, like which I explained to you earlier. These lesions are mostly present in the acral, that is the hand, feet, and in a variant of erythema multiforme, that is erythema multiforme major, you may have one oral mucosa involvement. Most commonly, it's the oral mucosa, but it could be any other mucosa. You, the, this type of a rash is not that severe and you can just treat the patient, ask him to stop the drug and go home. So both the syndromes had a history of drug intake, but they reacted differently. What is the spectrum? Basically, there is a spectrum of three disorders ranging from the mildest, that is erythema multiforme, to the middle one, Stephen Johnson syndrome, and the worst one, toxic epidermal necrolysis, 10. In Steven Johnson syndrome, usually less than 10% of body surface area would have blistering. And in Steven jo SGS 10 overlap patients, there would be about 10 to 30% overlap, body surface area involvement. But in 10 patients, the, the denusion of the skin goes beyond 30%. Coming on, the gory one, 10. It's a severe life-threatening condition with epidermal separation more than 10%. It is almost always drug-associated and carries with it a mortality rate of 50, 40 to 50%. It presents with high fever, acute skin pain, asthenia, difficulty in swallowing, urination, speaking, stingy eyes, all because of mucosal involvement. The skin looks dark, Progressing to involve the full thickness, full thickness denudation of the skin and detachment. How do I treat such patients? First of all, call your attending, your specialist. Then they treat the patient like a burn patient. The patient must be, uh, all his vitals must be assessed, his blood pressure, respiratory rate, tachypnea, all of this needs to be measured and documented. You must stop all drugs except the life-sustaining ones. Start hydration according to Parkland formula and start ophthalmology consult. In such patients, an amniotic graft may be required in the eye conjunctiva or the patient may lose his eyesight. Take blood for biochemistry, push for an ICU admission and start elect fluid and electrolyte monitoring with supplementation. We, have, we must prevent sepsis and ma uh, manage sepsis if you think the patient is in sepsis with IV antibiotics. How, do we have any drugs to reverse this condition? Sadly, it's a much debated topic in dermatology. Some say leave the patient alone, give him symptomatic treatment, and the patient will get all right if the drug is stopped. Some say high dose systemic steroids may help in the acute inflammation of the body. IVIG cyclosporins have also been tried, but with variable results. Nursing care is the most important aspect for such patients. There must, the patient is in acute amount of pain and agony and needs your comfort. He needs your tender love and care. <coughs> Maintain room temperature at 30 to 32 degrees Celsius because such patients tend to lose their ability to maintain body heat and we must maintain a temperature of 32 degrees Celsius. Regular cleaning, removal of crust from the oral and nasal cavities and care of eyes, genitalia and perianal region is required. NG tube feeding or parenteral in feeding may be initiated because of erosions in his oral mucosa and pharynx. How do we manage the denuded skin? Preferably leave as much denuded skin possible over, this, over the body. Topical agents like silver nitrate, non-physiological lipids, physiological lipids have all been tried to prevent skin from sticking on to the bed or the bed sheet. Banana leaves is an innovative new technique being used in southern India as a non-sticky dressing. But yeah, don't forget to sterilize it. Biological dressings like amnion, collagen-based skin substitutes, cadaveric allografts, and many other research molecule, uh, products are now coming up. Coming on to the next type of a drug rash. This is DRESS. Drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic <coughs> symptoms. It is also called as drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome. It is an idiosyncratic type 3 reaction and the, usually the drug intake history is between the period of 2 to 6 weeks ago. 
it doesn't present acutely. <laughs> Common culprits again are same anticonvulsants, sulfonamides, minocycline, aropyrinol, HIV drugs, NSAIDs, etc. The dermatological findings are not so severe. You may have a maculopapular rash, urticarial eruption, vesicles, bullae, but more characteristically, facial edema may be seen. Usually, such patients have more systemic symptoms compared to skin findings like fever, eosinophilia, lymphadenopathy, hepatitis, renal damage, and multi-organ system failure can occur if not corrected at the right time. In these cases, systemic steroids is our best friend again, and you can slow taper and the patient would recover. So what are your warning signs? First of all, for a patient of drug rash, is there a facial involvement, like a dress syndrome? <laughs> Is there widespread erythema more in the central part of the body, that's the face, neck, or in the acral lesions? What, is there skin pain? Is there a rapidly progressing rash? Is there blisters in the body, on the body? Fever, lymphadenopathy, features of anaphylaxis, and multi-organ involvement. These are the red flags. You must admit these patients and work them up thoroughly. And then some mellow conditions. Exanthematous drug rash. It's one of the commonest type, usually start between five to 10 days of a new drug intake and it's a maculopapular sort of a rash. Fever may or may not be involved. Suspected drug should be discontinued and the rash automatically subsides in one to two days. Angioedema. It is a type one hypersensitivity response and develops within few minutes to hours of intake of the allergen. There is a reactional edema of the deep dermis and mucosal tissue like oral mucosa, larynx, pharynx, etc. <coughs> Common allergens are foodstuffs like peanuts, etc. And drugs such as ACE inhibitors for hypertension, contrast, monoclonal antibodies. Sometimes angioedema may also be idiopathic. Treatment is epinephrine and steroids. This, this is a third scenario. Two-year-old healthy girl presents with history of acute onset, rapidly progressing exfoliating rash over the skin, associated with pain in the skin, malaise, <coughs> fever, but rest appears to be normal. This comes helps us get to the infection part of the dermatological emergencies. This little girl has Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. It is caused by exotoxin producing Staphylococcus aureus and usually attacks children less than two years of age. Children lack the immunity to such toxins and have a low renal clearance, hence they develop these symptoms. But usually they have better prognosis than adults. You, the rash starts cephalocordially, that is from the head, neck downwards, and there is mucous membrane is not involved. So I, how do I differentiate if a patient with denuded skin comes in the emergency? Whether is it SSS or is it Steven Johnson syndrome? Basically, there will be no mucosa involvement in SSS. The, in 10 patients, there would be full thickness epidermal necrosis and hence a glistening or a shining dermis would be seen. In, in SSS, the skin would have a subcorneal split. That is why when you see the denuded skin, it is not shiny, it is just rough. The treatment of SSS involves IV antibiotics sensitive to staphylococcal dependent on the area You're, you have been practicing in and in 10, you must just stop all non-life sustaining drugs. Necrotizing fasciitis. Well, my surgery colleagues would be better knowledgeable about it, but it's the necrosis of subcutaneous tissue due to infection of anaerobes, gram-negative aerobic bacilli, or enterococci. Type 2 necrotizing fasciitis is usually due to group A streptococci. This occurs in patients who have Im <coughs> Im uh, immunocompromised, such as diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, and immunosuppressed patients. It usually starts as a diffuse edema, followed by deep erythema, bullae, loss of all three layers of skin, followed by gangrene. There may be pain, anesthesia, crepitus, and exodus. Why I put this in my slide is because such patients usually are immunocompromised and have tinea infection in between the toe web spaces of their toe. These weak spots are from where the bacilli enters and commonly causes necrotizing fasciitis in the limbs. 
so we in these immunocompromised patients it is prudent to treat this uh, intertrigo infection or the fartenia infection in the web spaces so that they don't develop necrotizing fasciitis so, uh, treatments are admit the patient iv antibiotics and surgical debridement scenario 4 This is a four-year-old girl, known case of atopic dermatitis, presents with with two days history of new erythematous vesicular <laughs> erosive type of rash around eyes, face, and neck. This is eczema herpeticum. It is caused due to HSV virus one and two, and is seen in patients with underlying skin disorders such as eczema, atopic dermatitis, etc. The treatment is starting systemic antiviral therapy along with if the patient needs antibiotic therapy if you can see secondary infection of the vesicles the patient may need admission and an urgent ophthalmology referral is very important herpes zoster now why do i have this in dermatological emergencies first of all it is caused due to the reactivation of varicella zoster virus that is the chickenpox virus it is commonly seen in elderly but no age group is spared it has a classical unilateral environment which follows the dermatomal distribution and uh, prodromal symptoms occur in 60 60% of the patients as paresthesia numbness pain etc vesicular bullae are eventually seen after the prodrome pain is the most disturbing factor for the patient which forces him to come to the ed post herpetic neuralgia that is the pain persisting up to 3 to 6 weeks or sorry months post the healing of skin lesions is a problematic zone this is another picture of a patient with dermatomal classic dermatomal distribution of uh, her herpes zoster lesions so this is the last thing promise what is the what is the mo- what is the most important thing that i want you to take home the concept of acute skin failure what the function of skin was to protect the skin to prevent the water loss they this was lost what are the causes erythroderma disease process progress disease process involving more than 90% of body surface area usually psoriasis eczema disorders of keratinization or sometimes idiopathic and where some few very rarely cutaneous lymphomas can also lead to erythroderma few blistering disorders like ten and pemphigus may also cause it So what is the pathophysiology it starts with excessive vasodilation of cutaneous blood vessels which leads to decreased blood flow to the visceral organs this decreased blood flow leads to tachycardia hypertension tachypnea loss of body heat and loss of skin barrier functions like prevention of bacteria from getting in loss of body heat makes the patient poikilothermic and is dependent upon external body to, external room temperature to maintain the heat a very important dictum in dermatology is if a patient of erythroderma shivers the doctor must shiver you must treat it aggressively decreased urine output generalized body edema electrolyte dysfunction and sepsis may occur if prompt action is taken at this stage we can prevent the patient from spiraling down how do i manage such patients if there is excessive body heat loss then we must keep the room temperature between 30 to 32 degrees celsius we may use a burn cage blankets etc vital monitoring must be done fluid and electrolyte supplementation is essential input output charting of the urine is very important uh, dialysis may be needed in cases of urine output decrease and for sepsis iv antibiotics may be needed adequate nutrition is very important either via ng tube or parenterally okay. so if you have uh, initially it starts as hypertension because the heart is trying to uh, pull put as much blood in the vital organs but later on the patient goes into shock because and hypertension eventually hypertension shock renal shutdown electrolyte dysfunction can cause death of the patient so you must know the extent of the rash it which is important for patient survival outcomes basically the rule is one palm is 1% of the body surface area of the patient vital monitoring is essential 
how do i describe skin lesions over the phone know your primary skin lesions picture is worth a thousand words send it be cautious of warning signs in severe drug reactions which i told earlier be cautious with the use of oral steroids in psoriasis patients as the withdrawal can lead to fistula psoriasis be sure to document drug in the allergy section in which the patient developed the reaction thank you yesterday was diwali it is the festival of lights it is a very big festival in india as big as yola here so i would like to wish you all a very happy diwali <laughs>
I like this uh, Sonali having the next one, Benali. Uh, is it Benali? That's the name. Diwali. 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 Yes. Oh, Diwali. Yes. Sorry. Uh, uh, very interesting and good lecture. But uh, this, I, I'm wondering if dermatologists are caught in these very severe uh, and tragic uh, actions when people are getting acid in their face and body. That is a plastic surgery. The, the plastic surgeons are involved in that, yeah. From the beginning. Yes. Yeah. We have, um, my alma mater, Subdition Hospital, has the largest burns unit uh, in the country. Yeah. And uh, we have a lot of uh, acid attacks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a uh, Yes. Uh, this one area which is so constant insecurity for uh, me and of course in the medical part of the question of allergy. Uh, this is often maybe a pressing question in especially in antibiotics, you know, Yes. Because the history people say they have allergies and that's something when they were a child and then people have the label penicillin allergic and so on. Yes. What's your uh, you know, sometimes uh, the uncertainty is so great and you really need to use the antibiotics, yes. the aflatolactam antibiotics. A patient who said, well, once I think about the rest of penicillin or something like that. Uh, but just give the antibiotic under close observation. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a dangerous practice to do that? Um, actually, only penicillin is the only drug with, uh, of which you can test the sensitivity by giving the low dose uh, penicillin. That is the only antibiotic. Actually, you can prove the patient has a reaction or not. Rest of the antibiotics cannot be tested like this. And you have to basically go on the history of the patient. If the patient says, I was allergic to it, uh, because many times we tend to forget to mention it in the allergy section. So, and also because data may not be unified, like in India, uh, uh, all the medical records of the patient was not unified at one place. So if the patient was getting treatment from some other state, we do not know whether it was, uh, uh, whether it was true or not. So usually a cautious path towards this is to avoid the drug the patient says he's allergic to believe in him and to avoid other antibiotics of the same group. And to preferably go give different antibiotic. Also, uh, you have to just give it. You have to just do it. And medical legally, if we go, there is no problem because Stephen Johnson syndrome and these drug reactions are all idiosyncratic reactions. Nobody could have foreseen them. And legally, also, a doctor is uh, safe. Thank you. There's a question about angioedema. I'm a cardiologist, and uh, I like to have all my patients. Yes. So, uh, so the thing is that you can get it, as you mentioned, from both stops and other stops. But, <coughs> but uh, the question is: once angioedema winds on ACE, never ACE again. Yes. That, that, yes. That is still the rule. And never ACE, uh, ACE inhibitor receptor blockers also. The ARPS. subgroup ARPS. of ACE inhibitors. ARPS. Yes. On the ACE again, is there any connection between angioedema and the core one can see? Uh, yes, uh, it is a common finding that uh, you've put the patient on ACE inhibitor and maybe three or four months later the patient complains, I am having some dry cough, so ACE inhibitors are known to cause... Uh, no, I know that, but as far as I get more prone to develop angioedema. Um, I, I, I will have to check that up, but I don't think I've read anything like that. And check up and tell you. That's a yeah. question. There, there is, there is a directly bradykinin related problem. Yeah. It's accumulation of bradykinin. Just to follow up on a question about the Asian inhibitors versus the AFB. If the Asian inhibitor is in the other cop, and of course, stop the Asian inhibitor and send them to AFB, the cop disappears. Yes. But, um, is there a risk of angioedema? Uh, if these patients, um, uh, and... uh, this is angioedema is a life threatening condition. Yeah. If we give ARBs and the patient goes into angioedema, again, he will have a worse reaction. He will have laryngeal edema that can cause death to the patient. So, I think just to be on the safer side, there are many other antihypertensives that we can go for. But it cannot work. 
uh, it can definitely it can happen. Yeah. Uh, just uh, to remind us, uh, well, we in the surgical department uh, often get a rush from antibiotics, but uh, this what you said is that this rush usually comes five to ten days after we begin it. Uh, we uh, always think that if we give it, it should come the same day or the day after. That, that is obviously not true. Uh, but it, uh, is there any any drugs that uh, are, are different? Uh, are some drugs are giving it the same day, and some drugs are ten days after. Or is there any rule in this? Basically, the rule is that the type of hypersensitivity response the patient develops the drug. If it's a type 1 hypersensitivity response, like angioedema, IgE, antibody-induced reaction, the patient will develop the response very quickly, like in minutes or hours mm -hmm. of taking the drug, like ACE inhibitors. I'm just talking about the rash. Yeah, if there is an exanthematous rash, that is usually a type 3 or a type 4 hypersensitivity response. And type 3 hypersensitivity response is usually occurs between 3 weeks to 3 months mm -hmm. of starting the drug. And type 4 is extremely variable. It goes from 7 days to 90 days, 3 months again. So, uh, and plus no two human bodies are the same. The reactions are different. You may develop type 1 and the other patient, uh, some other patient may develop type 2, type 3. It is very uh, variable. Now what I really mean is that the confusing thing, if you give this drug for, let's say, 3-5 days, or something tends to be can they develop this uh, many days later after they come home? Yes. They, even though they have this continued drug? Uh, usually, if the, the rash was very mild, mm -hmm. we do not uh, ask them to stop the drug, like you said, and you no, continue no, we, the we, drug. We usually give these antibiotics only for five, five oh, seven days. Oh, after stopping the yes, drug. After stopping the drug, okay. can they develop the rash later? No, no, because it is usually cleared from the body. Uh, you can take up to seven half lives of the drug. Mm -hmm. After that, if the patient de uh, develops the rash, uh, it's just not it. Uh, last question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, with the lesions between the toes. Yes. Or yes. Or to and we might again because uh, the immediate future, I think, has been two patients uh, with antipasha and the both of them, unfortunately, I think it's about uh, two the box, right? Okay. Uh, so it's, it's uncommon, of course, but, uh, but it does happen. And just, uh, <coughs> yes. And where was that fasciitis in the in the legs or yeah, arms? The, in, the, in, the in the chest, yeah. Yeah, because chickenpox is like again a cephalocaudal rash, so maximum erosions are on the chest, and this is where the patient may have developed necrotizing fasciitis. So look for local regional causes for necrotizing fasciitis. Has it been described in the Yes, it has. Yes, uh, especially in immunocompromised HIV patients. Zoster sometimes leads to uh, necrosis and gangrene. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do I need to copy the presentation? I can just skip it. Yeah, no, you can just uh, put it on a Yeah, okay.